But we're going to continue. We're going to continue. I don't need to hear myself here. We're going to continue our four-week sermon series on the story of the lost son. Last week, we took a look at the younger son. This week, we're going to take a look at the elder son. Next week, we're going to take a look at the father. And the week after that, we get to take a look at the church. So I'm excited about it. I'm looking forward to it. I encourage you um, to let other people know about it. If, if you look out on where the guest book is, when you came in, there's some invitations, little postcard size. Just take one of those. Invite somebody. Have them come with you. Well, our scripture comes out of Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to the father, Father, give me my share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the country, and he began to be in need. <coughs> so he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would have gladly filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hands have been bread enough to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up. I will go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran, put his arms around him, and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of his slaves and asked him what was going on. He replied, your brother has come. Your father has killed the fatted calf because he got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I've been working like a slave for you, and I've never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed and the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. <coughs> Those of you that know me know that I, I like soup. I like to eat soup. The last few Lenten seasons, I would go on a diet where it was just fruit, vegetables, and soup. Now, mind you, that's not vegetarian. Some soups have meat in them. But fruit, vegetables, and soup, I mean, it, it is a little bit limiting. And so what I tended to do was get a little bit creative. I like to try different soups. and. One of the soups that I tried a few years ago was Reuben soup. Anybody ever tried Reuben soup? It's delicious. If you like Reuben's, it's quite good. 
And so I was kind of getting into the hankering for some Reuben soup since it's been so long. And it also is an incentive that I have a big giant chunk of corned beef in my freezer that's been there forever. And I thought I need to use that up. I'll eat some Reuben soup. And so it was on Thursday, I found myself out at Walmart, which, you know, that's fun enough, right? I mean, just going to Walmart is fun. And, and so, but I was waiting on a prescription, so I was kind of held hostage there. And I thought, well, how can I make use of this time? And I thought, I will shop for ingredients for Reuben soup. And I will eat <coughs> Reuben soup this weekend. And so that meant that instead of me feeling bitter angry about being at Walmart, I was like, hey, I'm getting the ingredients for Reuben soup. So I started to go all around Walmart and I got sauerkraut and I got uh, onions and I got cornstarch and I got, uh, you know, that super healthy thing called half and half, you know, because it needs a lot of that. And I need to make sure that I had chicken broth and I need to make sure I had a cup of beef broth and then I needed Swiss cheese. Now, I gotta warn you, be careful if you go to the deli at Walmart and ask for Swiss cheese. I, I said I need a pound of Swiss cheese and, and this, this kid came back with what looked like about a chunk this big and he said, I think this will do it. And he put it on, on the scale and uh, it was almost three pounds of cheese. And I said, I don't think it's wise that I eat that much cheese on my soup. And he goes, really? I said yes, and so we, he was very insistent that that was a good amount, but I, I finally got him to cut it down to about a pound and three quarters. So if you need some cheese, come on over. I got Swiss cheese. But you know, I got a lot of ingredients for this soup, and I do see, I do kind of think of myself as a little bit of a chef, not a great chef, but I, I can whip up a good recipe of something. I mean, I can do okay. But I have to admit that as I read this scripture this week, and as I began to contemplate the older son, I realized that I, I apparently come from a long line of, of biblical tradition of people that are good chefs, whipping up a nice recipe. The oldest son probably puts me to shame. He, he's a great chef in his own right. He definitely knows how to whip up a good recipe. I'll, I'll get to that a little bit more in a, in a minute or so. You see, the, uh, the eldest son is in a unique position. He's washed his brother blow it. You know, he, he watched his brother go to the, his father and basically say, Dad, I wish you were dead, so can I just please have my inheritance now? And then to his disbelief, the father said, okay, here's your inheritance. And then he watched his brother do the stupidest of all things. He takes all that he has, and he moves to a distant land, far away, so far away that he rejects all of the traditions, all of the relationships, all the things that makes that family special. He says, I got it covered. I'm going to do this on my own. Don't need you guys anymore. Well, you can imagine, I can imagine, it was no surprise to the eldest son that younger brother comes back home, was it? I mean, what are the odds that things are actually going to work out in a distant land? The scripture says a famine came. And the famine came after everything had already run out. He'd blown through all of his money, all of his resources. They were gone. And it was so bad that he was, eat, he was feeding pigs and thought, that looks pretty good. So he comes back home with this plan. The eldest son is, is watching this. Because all the time that the youngest son is gone, do you know where the eldest son is? He's at home. You know what he's doing? He's doing whatever the father asks of him. Father wants him to get up early. He gets up early. The father wants him to stay up late. He stays up late. The father wants him to miss a friend's 
sweating, he missed whatever it takes. He's there for the father. All the while, younger brother is off doing who knows what, blowing it. So when he sees, when he sees his younger brother is home, he is not amused. He is not impressed. He is not happy. He also is not amused and he is not happy and not impressed that his father is so welcoming. I mean, his brother just said, hey, dad, I don't deserve to be your son anymore. How about I just be your hired hand? And I imagine the older brother was like, I think that's a great plan. <laughs> but that's not what the father did. The scripture says, the, the son says, well, I don't deserve to be your son. I'll just be a hired hand. The scripture says the father would not listen. And they had a celebration. And the father just loved and forgave the younger son. And the older son was not happy about this at all. We know that there's a problem with the older son when he finally speaks out. There's one sentence that tells us there's, there's a problem. There's one sentence that says, red flag alert, that what it looks like it's not. And that's when he says to the father, the father goes and pleads with him, pleads with him to come into the house and celebrate. And he says, you know what, dad? I've been here all this time while my brother is blowing it. You never even killed a goat for me and for my friends even one time after I worked for you like a slave. And that's when I knew that the oldest son was a chef. That's when I knew that all the time that he'd been doing the right thing and people would come up to him and go, you know what, dude? I sure am glad you're not your brother. You know what, oldest son? I'm impressed. You, your, oldest bro your youngest brother left, but you have stayed and been faithful. And every day he got up and acted like it was all good for him. But I knew he was a chef because that one sentence that I've worked for you like a slave told me that he had whipped up a recipe of judgment, of condemnation, of anger, of resentment, of bitterness. That's not all. He continued to put in a, a dash of competitiveness, comparison, and rivalry. Comparing himself to his younger brother. Not just a word of advice. It never works well for us to start comparing ourselves to anybody, does it? But he did it. And so he comes up with this elaborate recipe. And we know that just because he's been doing all the right things, it hasn't been a cakewalk for him either. You see, the problem with this recipe the problem with resentment and all those other things that go around it is that it's a noose around your neck, just like the band sang about in the song. It's a weight on your shoulders. And no matter how many times you justify it, it's what it is. But worst of all, you know what the worst thing is about this recipe? Is that recipe of resentment it kept him at a distance from the Father. It kept him at a distance from the Father's love. And even though the Father came out and begged and pleaded for him to go in, that recipe of resentment and anger and hostility, it wouldn't let him. It wouldn't let him be able to receive the love of the Father. See, it, it turns out that this isn't the parable of the lost son. This is the parable of the lost sons, plural. Both of them 
or lost. One was easily identified. I mean, he was a nut job. He took a great life and said, I'm going to prove I'm worth something on my own. And he went and he squandered everything. That was a terrible thing to do. Everybody knew that. But the lostness <laughs> of the elder son is harder to identify. Because he was lost in resentment. He was lost in resentment. And it had a grip on him that we didn't know about until the youngest son came home. And so the youngest son is back home. He's being embraced by the father, and yet the eldest son who was there all along is somehow finds himself in that far and distant land. The eldest son was doing his duty every day. He was admired for it. He was praised for it. I imagine that it was part of who his identity was. Like, you know, he really couldn't imagine actually not serving at the father's house. He couldn't imagine actually going to a far and a distant land. But you know what I, you know what I venture to say? There was part of him that looked at his younger brother who went to that far and distant land and saw how careless and carefree he was and that there was a part of him that the eldest son wishes he could be. He wishes that he could just not care what others thought. He wished that he didn't need the approval of other people in his life. And he wished he could be just like his youngest brother. But jealousy, <coughs> anger, resentment, bitterness, all those wonderful things began to creep into his life because he didn't want to be that person. And so he began to continue to do all the things that he's supposed to do pretending like things are okay, when down deep there was a recipe of hurt and brokenness in his life. The same kind of hurt, the same kind of jealousy, the same kind of anger, the same kind of rivalry and comparison that happens to us when that family member gets all the attention, when that family, other family member gets all the money, when that person at work that doesn't even know how to do their job seems to get all the breaks and yet you're the one that has to do all the work to make them look good? Anybody, anybody know the person I'm talking about here? I hope so. I hope it's connected. Because I think the, the eldest son here is the most real of us all. Because we do the same thing. We put on our church clothes. We put on our church faces. We may even say the right things. But down deep, down deep, we begin to see jealousy. We begin, begin to see bitterness. And we run the risk of being lost. And we find ourselves even though we might be right here in church, we find ourselves that really lost in resentment means we're in a far and distant land and that we are far from the embrace, the eternal embrace of the Father. One of the things that is interesting about this parable is it is no Disney fairy tale. There is no neatly packaged ending to this story, is there? We do not know if the youngest son takes advantage of the love of the father, do we? Does the youngest son get his act together? Does he start pulling his own weight? Does he show appreciation for all that others have done for him? We don't know. We also don't know if the eldest son reconciles to the father. We don't know if he finally reconciles to his younger brother. We just don't know. There's a lot of this story we have no certainty about. There's only one thing that I would say we're certain about this story. 
that is absolutely crystal clear, 100% certain, and that is, that is the limitless love and forgiveness of the Father. The limitless love and forgiveness of the Father is absolutely indisputable in this story. And if that is the primary purpose of this story is to illustrate the limitless love and forgiveness of the Father, then job well done. But sometimes the limitless love and forgiveness of the Father is irritating, isn't it? It is. Because you know who's included in the limitless love and forgiveness of the Father? Your ex. That family member that you can't even stand to be around. That person that you thought was your best friend who stabbed you in the back. That person that you have to work with every day. Your enemies. The people you don't like. The people that are ridiculously irresponsible and cause you heartache and distress. They're included in the limitless love and forgiveness of the Father. So the only thing we have for certain in this is that God's love is limitless. God's love and forgiveness is limitless. That's the only thing. And that brings us to one of life's most challenging questions. One of most life's challenging questions, and this is true whether you have been a Christian for a hundred years or whether you're just starting out like little Sarah Ames. In fact, the longer we've been Christians, probably the harder it is. That brings us to life's most challenging question. Is will we trust the limitless love and forgiveness of the Father? Will we trust the limitless love and forgiveness of the Father? That is life's most challenging question. Will we trust the voice of the Father that just like he says to the eldest son, he says to you, he says, daughter, son, you are with me always. All that I have is yours. Will we trust that voice of the Father that says, daughter, son, you are with me always. All, all that I have is yours. Will we let that begin to sink into our souls? And will we trust in the limitless love and forgiveness of the Father? You ever hear Christians go, are you saved? You ever had a Christian come up and are you saved? I have, and there's some traditions. That's how they talk, you know? In the Christian church, we're just wondering, are you a Christian or not? In other traditions, they want to know, are you saved or not? Well, you might say, well, what do you mean, Pastor? What does it mean to be saved? Well, basically what it means to be saved is that, in a Christian sense, that God does for us what we can't do for ourselves, right? That there's something in our lives that we need saved from because we can't do it ourselves. Only God can. Well, I'm convinced this is a salvation story. I hope this scripture will help us to understand salvation. And the reason I say that is that sometimes we are so lost in resentment like the eldest son. Sometimes we've been angry for so long. Sometimes we've been hurt so deeply that the thought of actually giving that up it just doesn't even seem possible. It may not even seem, it may be, seem like it's so much part of our DNA that we can't imagine letting it go. The problem that we have is that our salvation is found in the internal embrace of the Father. Our salvation is found in the limitless love and forgiveness of the Father. And until we're able to let go of that hurt and that pain, until we're able to let go of resentment and anger and bitterness and that dark recipe, we'll never know that love. 
as long as we hold on to it, that deep darkness will begin to continue to take root and grow in our hearts. But salvation, salvation is when we finally come to the God and we say, God, you know what? I don't want this bitterness anymore. I don't want this hurt. I don't want this unforgiveness. But God, I don't know how to get rid of it. And we surrender to the limitless love and forgiveness of God. And that's what heals us. That's what makes us new. That's what recreates <laughs> us and makes us whole. The limitless love and forgiveness of the Father. Maybe some of you have heard the name Ursula Ward. If you watch ESPN at all, you may have. Ursula Ward is the mother of a former football player named Odin Lloyd. Odin Lloyd was a football player. He didn't play NFL football, but he did play football. And he was friends or acquaintances with, a, with an NFL player named Aaron Hernandez. Now, Aaron Hernandez did play for the New England Patriots. Well, things didn't go right, and there was a really bad night in which Aaron Hernandez took a gun and killed Odin Lloyd. Odin's dead. And just recently, Aaron Hernandez was found guilty by a jury of his peers, and he'll, he's facing life imprisonment. Now, Odin Lloyd, who's no longer with us, his mother would go to trial after trial after trial after trial. And it wasn't easy. This is what she had to say. Ursula Ward, she says, she told the court that she feels like this is a bad dream. She told the court that she constantly thinks about her son. She says, I miss my baby boy Odin so much, but I know I'm going to see him again someday, and that, he's, and that has given me strength to go on. But you know what? Odin's mom, Ursula, she said one more thing when she was asked about how she's dealing with the death of her son. And her response is so powerful that I want to share it with you. She said, I forgive the hands. I forgive the hands of the people that had a hand in my son's murder. I pray and hope that someday everyone out there will forgive them also. One more time. I forgive the hands of the people that had a hand in my son's murder. I pray and hope that someday everyone out there will forgive them also. You know who that is? That's a woman that trusts in the voice of God. The voice that says, my daughter, my son, you're with me always and all that I have is yours. That is a woman that has faced life's most challenging question. Will we trust the limitless love and forgiveness of the Father? And said yes. That is a woman that knows the eternal embrace of the Father. That is a woman that has found her way home. So as we deal with our own issues and our own recipes that are specific to our lives, as we contemplate if we'll trust in the limitless love and forgiveness of the Father, the question we have is who says you can't come home? Amen.